<laughs> there's a coincidence. Right. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I said, you know, I'll bring some people, and you know, I gave them the names of about 20 people, but I just gave their first names. And they said, well, we, um, we, we need the first and last names. And I said, well, I said, you know me, right? They said, yeah. I said, do you trust me? They said, yeah. I said, yeah, my last name, right? Yeah. Okay, that ought to be good enough. Because I know all these people, and I, I can vouch for them. So, uh, only, only their first names were given. It turns out somebody stole the list. They gave it to Larry McDonald. You know, he was this fascist congressman from Georgia. He was later killed in a plane crash. He prints the entire list of all the conference goers, almost a thousand people, in the congressional record. Okay, and you can go and look it up. But there's nobody from Buffalo. Because they didn't have their last names. Okay. Nice proof. Yeah, so a kind, of, kind of common sense things. If people are troublesome in the movement, it's important how we deal with them. If, if you're working in a tight-knit group, you know, on some issue, you know, deal, deal with the behavior. Don't make accusations. Just, if, you know, if people are disruptive and troublesome, deal with that. And if it continues, you kind of have to figure out how they're going to relate to the group without being soft about it, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a better word. But, you know, we can be tolerant without being foolish, you know. If it's disrupting our attempt to achieve goals and struggle, you know, then we have to deal with it and we have to sideline people for their behavior. We, we, we have to. And we do it in obvious and unobvious ways all the time. But we should try to be conscious of it. But, you know, people make mistakes, too. And we need to have room for that and talk about, you know, honestly talk about this is a problem for our work. This dynamic between you as a man and the way you're treating women is a problem for our group. Let's discuss it, you know. The first response shouldn't be, out, you know. It should be, let's, you know, have some other folks talk and work this out. and give people some, some room to develop and grow, too. But sometimes there's people that are so disruptive, you have to ask them to leave the group. And I've been part of those processes. And sometimes it's harder than others. And sometimes it's more serious than other times. You, you, know, you know, I wouldn't pretend to come here and tell people how to do that. But I'm just saying generally, you know, that's what we do in our work. And you probably will either have or will face the same dynamics. I, I wanted to talk about, uh, um, no, I forgot. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I had one other thing to talk well, about. Maybe, maybe this will help you remember the, on the point you're going to make. Um, and, and I say this as a person who's been involved in a lot of the, um, um, you know, Democratic Party activity much of my life, and I'm now active in the Working Families Party. So I have a lot, long history in the electoral movements, so if, if, or activity. It's not a little characterized as a movement. Um, but um, so I, I wanted you to know, you know my background before I ask the question, because I, I also um, you know, decided to be left of center. And Frederick Engels said about the 19th century political parties in the United States, that there were the single um, or two wings of the single bird of prey. You know, some people have heard that before. And I'm wondering how, in light of um, the fact that we have the Obama Justice Department um, carrying on these activities against um, you and, and, and your friends and, and your comrades, how you um, analyze all this? Because um, you know, many Democrats would say, "Well, this is the kind of behavior that you know you'd expect out of the out of." Um, a Bush White House or um, um, or a Reagan White House, but you know, many people would be you know would frankly be surprised I think to hear because a lot of people don't know about this of course going on that this is taking place under an Obama administration. Can you say what the question is? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean how, how how do you sort all this out? You know, in terms of I mean, is this in your estimation not at all surprising or? Um, in, in other words, w w would, would you look at this in the same way that Angles did? You know, that one party is just like the other, or? I, I think I'll, you know, I don't want to, I can't speak for the, you know, I'm here to represent the committee to stop FBI okay. repression. Okay. 
and I'm going to answer the question, but not on behalf of them, and not on behalf of the other 23, including Carlos, because I don't, you know, it's not a uh, subject we've had the chance to discuss okay. as a group. So I'll just say what I think, which is reflective of fight back newspapers approach, and um, maybe give you some insight to how we arise, arrive at our editorial views too, is in the last election, we went, if you, you know, over the years we participated in things like um, we would have supported Jesse Jackson back in the 80s as part of I, I the black movement's empowerment in the country. Uh, and the second time around, it added kind of the union element to the, the, the struggle. But once Jackson was knocked down by the Democratic Party, in fact, internally, then we just said, well, I'll vote for the lesser of two evils. And we didn't really, we don't endorse Democrats and we don't campaign in our work for them uh, in that type of situation. We would have supported Nader because Gore and Bush really sounded the same. I don't know if people remember, but we we backed Nader at the time, you know. And then, um, but then when Bush started the war on terror, we said, well, for this country, the people in this country and people overseas, it would be better to have, you know, uh, no wars. And uh, so we said the lesser of two evils, you know. But we didn't. We wouldn't have supported Kerry or campaign, but we would have taken out an anybody but Bush line. Mm -hmm. And then with Barack Obama, it was a little different again because you have the African American question come into play again around it. And so we, you know, again said Dump Bush was our. Well, Dump Bush was the previous one. So this was with. Uh, mm -hmm. McCain. So we said, uh, "Don't push." <laughs> Don't push again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we said uh, we had a clever thing for McCain, but uh, uh, I can't think of the slogan all of a sudden. But it was against it was against McCain anyway. But it, it was uh, it was a good slogan, and you know. So then when McCain lost, our headline was McCain down in flames, which would remind him of his youth, and. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, people would say, well, that's backhanded support for Obama. And we would say, no, our focus is on building the anti-war movement and building the people's movements. We didn't say go campaign, you know, for Obama. We just said a lot of people want to discuss, you know, the elections. And our answer is go out and build movements for social change. That's the main thing to do. It's good to vote against the, the worst candidate. You know, and we didn't tell Greens not to vote Green. You know, we have a lot of friends who vote third party, and some of us do. So that's what we did before. But now we're faced with this dilemma. Sure. It's a real dilemma, and we're debating it. <laughs> that's my main answer, is we are debating it. Um, most of the folks who are raided and subpoenaed say, we, we can't say to people that, you know, they should vote for the lesser of two evils, because we might be in prison when they're voting, you know? Um, me, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I don't have a, a strong opinion yet. But I'm thinking, well, we're not in prison because of the movement. And so our idea of focusing on building movements is correct and not get tied up in electoral politics too much. But don't ignore it either. It's also a fact that so far we're not on trial or in prison, if a Republican's elected, I feel confident that will get turned on us, right? You know, the stuff they tried to pass in the Senate to this week was bad enough with Democrats leading it, you know? But, you know. I think there were 33 Democrats that voted against it. Yeah. A woman in Albany, she, this woman was great to be on a stage with. She had thought these things out. Her view of this uh, bill that came up in the Senate was that Obama went to Levin, the senator in Michigan, who's usually quite liberal, and went to him to get McCain to sign on together to develop this bill so that Obama could actually veto it on purpose to make a clear statement that it's the president who will continue to decide where the wars are, like Libya, 
So it reinforces that the president has the power to make war over the Congress. Well, Obama threatened veto not because of the indefinite tension, whether it includes U.S. citizens or not. He was threatening veto because it was too restrictive on executive powers. That, that's her point. You agree with her. But that's what he, that's what his administration said. Right. That's that's what she was. It's where we agree. <laughs> yeah, I just want to throw out literally one word: republicrat. You know, uh, it's just, I personally think it's totally useless now, you know, when, I used to believe in the lesser truth, but, uh, you know, Johnson was a peace candidate, you know, I mean, but this has been going on all a long time, and, uh, the electoral yeah, reform, and uh, I, I think it's just, it, it's totally, in a way it hurts, it, it's, Obama's really hurt the movement, but it's coming back, obviously, more and more people are seeing that he's no better, and it's just the same old thing. What do other people think about that? Electoral reform. <laughs> this whole lesser two evil thing. Uh, why do we focus on that? I, I personally, I don't think it's always an um, um, either or question. I mean, we just look, you know, elected a fairly decent, well, uh, somebody we hope it's going to be decent anyway, um, county executive here. Well, there's an exception. I, I voted against county. Right. <laughs> um, our, our three the members of our congressional delegation, while, while not perfect, they all voted against the, um, the, the free trade legislation. You know, our three Democratic congressional representatives in Western New York. And some of us like, worked to, to lobby them to make sure that they did, they voted that way. I think Maybe locally could, to make it. I'm, I, I, I'm saying nationally, I think it's total waste. Yeah, it's my opinion. Yeah, I think there's a lot of unity in the movement actually about working on a local level, you can have more of an impact. I think. In city after city we go to, we meet people who are generally anti both parties and generally against working on elections, except at the local level, you know. So, um, but I think it's a question that comes around every two years with elections that our movement has to answer. And every Occupy discussion I've been in always ends up in the elections or not debate. And, I kind of walk away at that point. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said I don't think it's a either one question. <laughs> Sister. That's really a shame that what's going to happen once again in such a short period of time is that a tremendous movement in the streets is going to be siphoned off in the service of the very people that the movement in the streets are opposed to. The very wealthy forces that dictate where the wars are and where the profits go and how much people are driven down. Um, and in, in their interest, they pull the attention of the majority of, certainly all of the media, and um, the majority of everything that we read and hear and talk about, people who really were interested in fighting in their own behalf, on their own turf, in their own names, are going to be out there fighting for somebody else who is not in their interest and is not going to be in their interest and is not going to fight in their own. Your way, maybe not. <laughs> but then, on the other hand, maybe not. If, if people if people do keep the movement going, people do stay in the streets. And people do see the need to fight and really are fed up with the status quo. Uh, the elections will become a meaningless, which they already are, but a meaningless feature to what's really going to do things, make a difference. It'll, it'll just be, that's why a lot of people don't vote. That's why the vast majority of poor people whose lives haven't changed because of elections right. don't vote. So but coming off of that, where do people see Occupy movement going? Electoral and, reform. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where, uh, I, I, I would like to hear what people's views are about why is the repression happening? What's the effect of the repression, and what's going to happen next in terms of repression of the movement? 
Yeah. So this brother. I think Nate, you were you were before me, right? Were you? Well, yeah. Um, no. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah. I just um, I'm I'm opposed to to voting, but uh, but basically just because uh, I just feel like we're in a very uh, you know the environment is being destroyed, people are dying uh, all across the world. The things are just getting worse, and and like you like we're like at like a really pivotal point and like is this system that's been founded on genocide and on slavery and on the class institution and like pivotal a ruling class and the wealthy and the poor like all those things are inherent in the uh you know this whole system and um i think if we are to put energy towards something that we have very limited of that we shouldn't put any of that towards electoral politics because we're trying to build I think representative system in general just isn't good because you're representing you're asking someone to represent you um, but anyway that's just the way I view it but what I really like about what you said that it's not a, a main focus of yours that you do building and it sounds like you do a lot of building on a broad basis with church and unions and um, we don't we lack of coherency in the movement here in Buffalo with uh, you know the peace center the unions the occupy uh, us here and I would really like to see uh, more unity and I just want to know different strategies on because I don't you know I'm not for voting but it's not a big thing a lot of these politics right. to me I don't care I want to work on things right. moving towards something so how do you yeah, how do you build those things what are the strategies oh I just wanted to yeah, go along with those two points and, and, and I hope with occupy I just hope that and not to uh, uh, like preach at people, but kind of suggest and, and to, to, you know, to tell the occupiers and, and keep it going that the main, to me, the main thing is people in the streets. That, that's, you know, voting, you know, that, you know, it, it, that's not, we don't want to get co-opted definitely by any, any kind of politics or any politician. Uh, I just hope, my hopes is that it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more people in the street demanding, that's what we got to do, we have to demand our, we have to take care of ourselves and, and our needs because yeah, no politician really cares. Very, very few. The ones that do don't get anywhere anyway. But uh, uh, and unions, yeah. I mean, if we can get you know, if this if this could pick up momentum, get stronger. I mean, if the if the truckers you know shut down, you know, I mean, that, that, that would really scare you know Wall Street, you know, things like that. That's what we have to do. And, and I hope that. Again, obviously people, you know, uh, I just hope, you know, people don't waste too much time on, 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 on thinking that somebody else is going to do, do things for us. That's right. That's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> I think that you can make a demonstrably provable case for the fact that um, elections as far as Republicans and Democrats are concerned are just a big game that, you know, really, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, but you can see sort of like the function of the game, like how it's put in place to sort of occupy everybody's energy. And the flashpoint that you mentioned in history, like 2000, where a lot of people were seeing this sort of Republican and Democrat, it's like, you know, who can see any difference between the two of them? And a lot of people were thinking about what we can do other than Republican or Democrat as our options. Um, and I think that a consequence of that election, like 2000, the game itself felt it necessary to really ramp up what the consequences can be. Mm. Like it's, I mean, they, they sort of like got people re-interested in the game of like, well, if you get this idiot these things that you always learned in civics class and these things that you learned in high school that could never ever happen here um, actually can now start to happen here. Um, so you need to come get interested in the game again. And I feel like a lot of people sort of, you know, got re-enthralled with like, wow, you know. And so, I mean, it's hard to sort of, you know, you know, you get people who are, who are interested and enthusiastic and they have a person that they want to put their faith into to legislate on their behalf and all this and it's hard to make a compelling art. I mean you don't want to just throw 
disparagement and you know negativity and discouragement on everything that they want to do, and especially given the fact that you know I myself might be organizing campaigns that I want their help in and want you know other people to do things to help me. Um, it's hard to explain, like, oh, yeah, every four years taking 15 minutes to go vote is, you know, like I just totally, you know. So I know people in local politics who, to me, I actually know them from personal relationships with them and believe that there is some reason to vote for them and go and vote for them. But we really need to look into ways to express to people just how fully it really is just a game without being soul crushing to them, with giving them an option to do something else that is more me. I mean, because really, if you're in activism, if you're in a movement, if you're in it for the long haul, there's like four years that happen between elections, or even two years that happen between elections. You know, there's 364 days that, you know, where you have important things that you have to do, you know, and not just this one day, like this is all or nothing, we have to put it all on the table and hope that, you know, and just keep pulling the roulette wheel even though like all the, there's no winning combination, you know. <laughs> there is no jackpot tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what about the Occupy movement? Like, I, I'd like to hear what people speak to that. I think in terms of the repression, I think, a lot of people are diminishing or underestimating to what extent energy is dispersed by getting kicked out, like how much energy is really lost. I think a lot of movements have been disintegrated or knocked out by repression. I think people from the Black Dead often. So you're saying that repression by the government is working to disperse people and the soul killing, I think, I crushing think state. I think it's going to disperse Occupy. I think that has enough momentum, but I, I really think we have to figure out a way to deal with it. But Just people around sense. Occupy who might be drawn into it are being kind of buffered out of it by the repression. I think. Maybe. Say again? I'd be interested to see what happens with it if that does really. And I'm sure that's the case for some people. It'd be interesting to see. What happens now that they're, they've been doing all this across the country? A, a younger brother spoke in uh, Albany last night. He's a lawyer with, like, you know, you know, one of those lawyers who has like a, a, a not just a law degree, but a degree in the law. You know, <laughs> emeritus and you know a lot of Latin words. He he really knew the law, but he's participated in the Occupy movement from the get go. And it's important in in that city, and you, you know, in that city, you had Cuomo, the governor, try to say, "I'm going to arrest everybody in the park," and so this guy was pretty important to say, "Well, the city owns this part of the park, so we'll just move over across this line." Scotty is privately owned, actually. Right, and and then and then uh, the police chief, who people apparently worked for years to get into his position. The progressive people mm. at the Unitarian Church where I spoke last night worked to get the police chief to be the person who he is, and he said, I'm not arresting any protesters, we have policing work to do, right? Pretty amazing. Yeah. And then the DA said to Cuomo, well, any protesters who are arrested, I'm not prosecuting. Yeah, he was elected, by the way, with the Working Family Party support. Okay. <laughs> so... <clears throat> well, there's an example where... where Work. Yeah, but in most of the country, what we have is the police march in and tear it down and throw it away, right? They throw away libraries. I've been in three occupied kitchens that I guarantee you are cleaner than any restaurant kitchen I've ever worked in. I've worked in a lot of dirty restaurants, I guess. And they're very clean and nice, and people seem to be taking great care with each other and protecting each other and dealing with each other's problems and I'm very impressed in all the places I've seen which is about five now but you know when they sprayed those two young women in New York who were already fenced in yeah. I, you know I'm in Michigan and I'm going I want to go to New York <laughs> I want to be there 
And apparently a lot of New Yorkers did, because the next morning there were thousands, right? So that repression caused a huge movement response. Same thing in Davis. Davis, yeah. I was going to say, you know, Berkeley, where they baton the students, caused Davis to happen, right? And the, the thing in Davis with the pepper spray is everyone, my mother, I called her today, she's outraged about it, you know? So everybody is, is upset about that. And, you know, I, I you know, um, since the brother was at Kent State, you know, largest student strike in American history. I wanted to tell you this is uh, I helped organize the 20 year conference at Kent State in Jackson State in Mississippi. Uh, but I had a personal reason too, which is when Kent State happened, I was in first grade in a public school in a white ethnic working class neighborhood outside Chicago. And our school walked out, you know. First graders were like, we're against <laughs> Yeah. And my, I, well, I shouldn't say some other things. But, you know, the fifth graders and sixth graders organized it. And, you know, it, it shows you how deep the impact of the anti-war movement was, that it was reaching these working class kids. And we refused to go into the school. There were teachers chasing us through the school field. And we marched in a group singing. We were singing. I don't remember what we were singing, but I know we were singing, you know? Like students in Europe do that a lot more. So, so they're chasing us around, and eventually we went back to school. But my point is that there's times where these schisms, is that the word? You know, these things occur where the government suddenly has the sense that they've lost control. And I tend to think that the the, the Wall Street thing, you know, the Occupy Wall Street, that the finance capitalists know what the crisis is like. Uh -huh. And in some ways, maybe they know even better than we know or understand more than we understand. And it's worse in their, in their sight. And so us and the people occupying, we have a similar consciousness that this crisis is really severe. And we know what the dragon looks like, and we want to slay the dragon, you know? But the finance capitalists are saying, we got to stop the Occupy movement from creating, you know, 900 cities and towns. People came from Muskegon, Michigan, to Grand Rapids, the big city, you know? <laughs> because they were like, we're Occupy Muskegon. We wanted to see what the bigger Occupy looks like in your city. And we're thinking, we're. Uh, small potatoes, you know, but it's so pervasive across the country this movement and I'm just wondering like it seems so far that the repression to me I guess I've been thinking that it's backfired again and again in terms of building sentiment but it doesn't necessarily disagree with your point that it may build sentiment but it's not mobilizing people to come into the into the Occupy movement and be on the streets with us yet. It's definitely valid that like it's backfired in some ways, but I just don't think you can underestimate what it's like. I think people underestimate the power of the repression. Of the really. repression. No, I you know, I I mean Oh it's definitely scaring some people. Yeah, I'm coming from joining, yeah. When they see that. See this is the discussions I want to have yeah. across the country, yeah. brother. Yeah, well, you know, there's there's definitely, you know, there's FBI influence on me, even beyond FBI influence that it's even limiting my engagement with um, with, with the Occupy. And what I'm seeing happening with Occupy is that it, it is being co-opted in a political way to, to target um, against Obama. Um, the, the power structure that be, you know, it, it's nothing for them to crush our economy. I mean, there's, there's, it's, it, this is a globalized thing. This is an international mm -hmm. thing, and um, and it's even above Wall Street. Wall Street is is an instrument in in this, and um, um, so what, what's happening is 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 it's it's there's a political faction that's trying to you know redirect this energy to try to place some blame on on, on a candidate that well, he's, you know he's an incumbent they want to oust. And, and try to get some other, you know, candidate in there, but um, whether or not this particular candidate that that they're trying, they're, they're promoting, has our interests 
at heart, it, it remains to be seen. But there's, but there's, um, there's definitely a movement. There's definitely um, um, not necessarily movement, but um, it, it's being orchestrated at, at, at levels even above Wall Street per se, above say Goldman Sachs. Um, there's there's human beings within those organizations that carry the clout, and and they're making some decisions. And it's an international it's an international type of movement. It, 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 you know, from what I'm gathering now, it is kind of linked more into this so-called new world order type of thing. And um, and and yeah, they're dismantling they're dismantling the U.S. Constitution. The part of the goal is to really dismantle the United States along with with Europe, um, and, and and try to build this the so-called unified global society, but um, the, the methods that they're using, you know, is 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 frightening and disgusting. It's an, it's inhumane. And start really doing. I've been doing some research in my free time lately, and, and it's just it's disturbing the stuff that I'm coming up with and finding, and, and that. So, um, but you know, long as the the occupy, the long as there is some attention, you know, what's been going on at at the, at the Buffalo Occupy, and I'm not sure if it's happening. I would imagine it's probably happening at the other occupies. Is, is the, are they, they are having some teachings. You know, as long the, the goal really is, is we've got to we've got to raise awareness and we've got to educate people. You know, the most the, the power, the most effective way to talk power, uh, to you know, talk authority, you know, talk. Uh, what's the word I want to say? Truth. Truth. Truth, truth to power is to tell truth to the community because that's really where the power is. Right. And 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 the more that you know the, the the things that you are doing, and and more of us have got to get on board and, and spreading the word and. Um, and communicating with people, and you know, there, there's no panacea, there's no free ride. We all got, we all got to knuckle down and do some work. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, sister, and then the brother in the orange. I just, um, I was wondering if you would sort of talk to Nate's question about, just from as an organizer, how you were able to, uh, you know, getting different groups that that should be working together and work together. That's one question. It's just answering that question and. The other is just the question on my mind. I think maybe you were sort of talking about it, but just how is we as a community can? Well, my question to you is actually going to be sort of like, how can what can we do to stop FBI repression that you're talking about? Besides, you know, protesting and following your guys's case and, and all of that. You know what? Um, what can we do in general, and then what can we do as a community if that comes to our community, to the organizers? And